The Universe. Rainbow Double Dances, Return of Tamerlan, Season 2, Episode 1, Geology of Shadows. It took more than a little effort, but Lyra was able to force herself back onto her barrel and into a sitting position after Grogar left, and the dozen cell plunged into nearly total darkness. Her ears twisted a few times. So she tried to ignore it as she thought. T Rex. Of course, Grogar was trying to do something involving T Rex. Why wouldn't he? It wasn't enough for Tamerlan or any Grogar to crawl out of the mists of history. He had to bring friends. No doubt that Grogar's plan would involve the Smooths or Lavon or some other ancient monster at some point as well. Iris shook her head, trying to clear it whatever Grogar had done to her. The hooves went up to ring on her horn. It was magically clasped in place, and after a few minutes of pain and grunting, she gave up on trying to take it off. It was bound to her magic like some kind of magnet, but it would be impossible to remove herself. The element of loyalty was missing as well, she noticed. Getting the act back from whenever Grogar or Bray had thrown it would be her first priority. Well, I just see managed to get out of the cell anyway. Her ears twitched again, and once again she ignored him as she forced herself to stand, trying to peer into the darkness of her cell. It was small, she could tell that much, and like any kind of window, instead of simply being solid stone. There was a pile of straw in one corner, and though the straw stank and now she didn't want to go near it, it was clearly decomposing. Her ears twitched again, she went over to the bars of her cell, looking them over. They were solid, rooted firmly in the ground and ceiling. She bucked at one a few times, but didn't feel them vibrating in the silence. Whatever the state of the seals in terror, the bars were well made and weren't going to budge. She got a little additional hope from the door. A solid piece of metal and looked heavy. Lyra had no idea how to pick locks. Lyra sat down next to her cell's bars, slipping a hook through the gap. She was surprised at how far apart the cell's bars seemed to be. But then, this cell would have been built by, by and for donkeys, who were larger than ponies. Lyra could see her the moment she leaned forward, placing her head against the bars. They might have been just wide enough for part two. Her ears twitched again. She stopped what she was doing, listening. Her ears weren't twitching out of some kind of nervous chick. They were hearing something faint, she realized. She listened turning her head and ears to try and zero in on the sound. Nats Igonama Bakti Baba Siti Um Igonama Nazi Surinama Bakti Baba Siti Um Igonama They were words coming from somewhere down to dungeon and said in a quiet a voice so quiet it could be barely called a whisper. One of Iris' eyes narrowed as she listened. She had never heard the words before, but that's zebra, she said softly. She didn't speak a word of Zebra, but she had an uncomfortable amount of time to hear it being spoken, not long after meeting Trixie for the first time. What it was being said, or chanted really, several cells down, sounded a lot like chants and invocations she had been exposed to. Both of Lyra's eyes narrowed then. If she was hearing Zebra, then there was only one reason. Sakura! She exclaimed. The chanting paused for a moment, and then resumed. Lyra stomped a hoof on the floor. I know you can hear me, she exclaimed, pressing herself against the bars, squinting against the darkness, trying to make out the zebra. She didn't have a good view of any of the other cells, however. She was pretty sure she knew which cell the Tanti was coming from. Two cells down from hers, on the same side of the hall. Lyra sat down, glaring down the hall. How Spike? she asked. The Tanti stopped a moment again, but then resumed. Lyra knows a slight change to his temper now. She took her and pressed herself up against the bars again. He left Corona, she nettled, called her insane. Twilight told us she met him, told us about what happened. Don't know where he is now, though. How's it feel to know a baby dragon would rather take its chances out there in the wilderness than be with you? That he thinks it's safer. Lyra didn't pause this time, but Lyra stopped the hoof again. Why are you following her? She demanded. Corona's completely insane. Can you tell that? Or you would see as well. Lyra thought she heard a slight chuckle, almost interrupted chanting, but wasn't sure. She narrowed her eyes again, listening closely to it for a few seconds before it began to hum along with it. So Corona's voice was very low, so it was difficult to match. But after a few minutes, she matched the core perfectly. And after a few minutes of that, this is the core was no doubt getting comfortable with the addition of her humming. 
even if he didn't know the reason for it, Lyra began to introduce very, very slight irregularities and mistakes to the tunes he was humming. They were so small that she doubted the car would actually proceed them without knowing what she was listening for. But she couldn't help but follow along to the tune, including the mistakes. After a few minutes of that, Lyra began introducing larger ones, and larger ones still until at length. So Cora was off on her meter by a full two beats. She noticed that, stopped chanting at the same time that Lyra stopped humming. After several moments, the Cora began again. Lyra messed her up chanting again several more. There was no true match to what Lyra was doing. That's the efforts of somebody incredibly skilled at music. And Lyra said so herself, intentionally trying to ruin a tune. After a third time, Lyra finally got more of a reaction from Sakura. She heard a snort and a hoof stomp. Lyra grit her teeth at that. Why? She demanded. Why did you betray us in the Everfree Forest? The sirens, the poison joke, why? There was no immediate response. Lyra was worried that she was about to receive the silent treatment. At length, however, Sakura's voice echoed out of darkness. There are matters larger than you or I that they dictate with whom Sakura allies. Lara's eyes narrowed. What's that supposed to mean? She demanded. Sakura was silenced for several more long moments. Lara wondered if she was trying to think of how best to rhyme before finally speaking again. With prophecy calls you by name, it is unwise to ignore its claim. Lara bit back and laughed. Prophecy? You think you're carrying out some kind of prophecy? Do not treat the matter so crass, when my will had already come to pass. On the longest night of the thousandth year, I was to release the queen, it was made clear. Now that my will has been fulfilled, her new kingdom I will help build. Lyra heard some pretty tall claims in her day, and came with being friends with Trixie. But this one just took about the cake. You released Corona? Lyra deadpanned. You broke through the magic of the elements of harmony? So Carl was silent, but Lyra took his confirmation that the Carl certainly was at least believed what she was saying, no matter how ridiculous it was. I bear no ill will towards bony folk, said Carl silently, but I listened when the prophecy spoke. You would be wise to do so as well. It is unpleasant and present where prophecy must impel. Uh huh. I note that in spite of the fancy prophecy, you're still stuck in here. Was that part of the plan? You think my gifts far too grand. I cannot tell the future on the map. You don't seem all that useful then, Lyra said, especially if it's impelling you to ally with Corona. She's insane. Completely, totally insane. You seem smart. You have to realize that. So Cora laughed out loud then. <laughs> A thousand years within the sun, she said. I wonder to your sanity what that would have done. But she has a role to play in what's to come before the next year is over and done. Lyra's eyes narrowed the statement. This another prophecy? she asked. No, unicorn. It is when my visits end. I cannot see beyond the coming bend. The future has always had a shifting form. But past this coming summer, I see naught but a storm. There is only one thing my visits have bought. That the eloquent Celestia will play a part. She probably is a star. Perhaps unicorn, though I do not believe so. I admit it's something I do not know. But until the storm has gone by, I still remain the Queen's Anna. Lyra pressed her hopes against the bars of her cell. She realized she, well, she could be looking at Sakura in the eye right now. And our enemy, she said. I follow my visits as best I can. I do not expect you to understand. That we must be enemies is regrettable an event. But there is nothing something I could prevent. You would never ally with the Queen. The result of our battle, then, remains to be seen. Lyra grunted, looking back at her prison bars. She ran a hop along them. They really were of excellent construction, but they were, equally, not designed for an equine being as small or as thin as her. Regardless of what Grogar said about her and Sugar, Shut up for a moment, she said. So he ignores the chorus of Taurus, he pressed her head between the bar's pieces, pushing forward. It was a tight fit, but she was able to slip her head in through relatively easy. She so pulled her back in, turned around, getting her head through wasn't an issue. It was getting her hind quarters through. That might have been a significant problem. She bit back a skeezy remark about herself and her flank. 
if not for her talents she really had a chance to make use of. In fact, she was double jointed practically along her entire body. Good thing, too, but she had no idea how she managed to fit. Inhaling a lot for one thing, shimmering back and forth, attempting to ignore no small amount of pain. She wept up more than a little sweat, but that actually helped. After several long, painful minutes, she managed to get her hindquarters through the bars, and through only by balancing on her right and front and rear hooves. Her left hooves up in the air, she took a few minutes to breathe, but then it was back to work. So he's surprised she didn't break any ribs slipping through the bars, but she managed to get her bell through, her shoulders, and lastly, after several long moments, her head. Lyra took a few moments to breathe, looking at the door to the prison. That was probably Lark too. Lyra had no idea how many goblins would be waiting for her beyond it. Where to go, what to do. It would be a long, harrowing trip, she knew, especially alone, and while her spells to aid her. Hearing a long sigh, she tried down the dozen hall to Sakura's cell and looked in. Sakura was standing there, waiting for her, one eyebrow raised. Sebra was larger than Lyra, who had never been able to duplicate what Lyra had done to escape her cell. We're enemies, but I'm going to assume neither of us are on good terms with Grogar either. She said, the tattoo match the suppressor ring wrapped around her horn. Get this ring off my horn, and I'll let you out. We can help each other escape this castle and get back to hanging each other later. So Cora considered several moments before looking at Lyra's hooves and spitting. The point backed up ground low. Fine, be that way. Sakura, however, ignored her, going to where she spat and using a hoof to pick something up. A tooth, Lyra realized. She went to the site. Um, what are you doing? The part over to the door is locked. Teeth in one hoof. She placed it in the keyhole, then broke it with a quick blow. Tiny gobble of thick green liquid pour out, but after a moment began to smoke and sizzle, he away at the lock. In a moment, the lock, lock had entirely melted away. Sakura entered the cell store with no issue. Lyra points a few times. You kept that in your mouth? And you could break it out any time, why didn't you? The time was not right to bring an end to my plight. Alone in Tamalon, I can stand no more chance than you. Together, we shall see what we can do. She tilted her head towards Lyra. But my loyalty remains with the sovereign son. We shall not be friends when all is done. Lyra rolled her eyes away to hoof. Fine, just get this off of me. She dared to hoof at the ring wrapped around her horn. Sakura hesitated a moment before reaching out with her hooves, pulling at the ring around Lyra's horn. Unlike with Lyra, the ring slid off easily. The ring binding it to Lyra's own gave it away, but it was interrupted by the determined effort of a third party. Lyra immediately ran some magic through her horn, smiled when it glowed gold. Sakura tossed the ring down the hall. Let us go! My Grogar's attention is low, she said, taking the lead as he trotted towards the door. Sakura Lyra followed, raising an eyebrow to trust in Harry and Sakura's tacking point. She wasn't sure she would have accepted an ally of inconvenience to follow her so easily. Despite herself, though, she couldn't resist. The chance to nail Sakura just a little more. Is it hard? Taking up rhymes all the time? Sakura glanced at Lyra arcly. No, it is not so. But if you need to rhyme more rhymes. Sakura rolled her eyes, but didn't answer. Lyra bit back a snore at that, but turned her attention to the prison door. As with their cells, it was locked. Lyra closed her eyes and set her horn glowing, working her magic to the door's keyhole. She couldn't pick a lock, but with the proper application of force, after a few minutes of effort, there was a satisfying pop in the door, and it swung inwards. It revealed a trio of Glogar's golems staring at Sakura and Lyra. The two equines let out cries of surprise and fell back, but the golems didn't move. They just continued to stand there, slightly hunched over and with mouths hanging open, but otherwise not moving. And not for their glowing eyes, Lyra would have thought them inert. Lyra's mouth opened and closed a few times before she was able to get sound out, getting over her fright. Why aren't they attacking? So he asked. Why this is, I cannot guess. But that they are not does not depress, Sakura provided. She started towards the door. Prisoners must not escape. The three gongs said as one just as Sakura reached the door's threshold. Reaching for her. Sakura backed away at their sudden words. And once he returned to the prison hall, the golems stopped. Back up and resumed the previous persistence. 
Meyer tried up next to her, considering them. Glogar's brain must have ordered them to prevent us escaping, Meyer said. Right now, as long as we're in here, we can't have escaped. So Cora could see her, tilting head tilting aside. For all his skill, it would seem. Glogar could not make his toys. One golem said towards them. Unicorn. Ordering. Has been. Removed. It said. That's why the trio spoke again. Prisoners are attempting escape. Oh, come on! Lyra moaned. Sees the car back away while the golems marched towards him. Return to your cells. Wait, 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 wait! Lyra tried. Though she continued to back away. She glanced at herself in front of Cora. You can't hurt me. Grogar wants me alive, right? Because he glanced behind her and said, Cora, stay behind me and my help. The girls stopped at that and Lyra smiled. Her smile dropped when they spoke again and resumed their march. Execution is preferable to escape. Oh, come on! Lyra groaned again. As the golems lunged, Lyra's horn glowed bright, conjuring a telekinetic seal in front of her. Nearly as wide as the hallway. Gaul smacked into it, but recovered immediately. One going left, one going right, and the final one trying to scramble over the shield. Sakura acted then, getting out from behind Lyra, dashing up to the one on the left, as it tried to get around Lyra's shield. She turned and bucked at it with her hind hooves, crossing its body with one arm against the wall. It kept coming, however, slicing at her with one good claw. Lyra directed her shield upwards. Penny one that had been trying to climb over against the ceiling, and started pounding his claws, feet, and head against the shield, trying to break it and sending jolts of pain straight down Lyra's horn. But she had to ignore them, as she dealt with a third golem slipping her throat and claws. She avoided getting nicked, but reached back, looking out with her front hooves. She managed to cast the golem's eye, and went flying from a socket hit the ground somewhere out of sight. She did it slower than down slightest, of course, as it lunged again. Lyra leaped backwards, releasing her telekin to hold on the golem overhead. It fell down on top of his comrade, forcing both to the ground. The two golems tried to untangle themselves from each other, but Lyra was on them quickly, leaping on top of them and stomping down as hard as she could on anything that felt more solid than mere hay. She managed to get one golem to stop moving, but the other managed to tear herself free from the tangle, literally tear the bottom half of his body, rippling loose as the top half dragged away. Then it turned around, Holding itself up on clawed hands, even a straw, some kind of black fluid leaked from its insides. Lyra froze to the sight. The golem was there, but it was knocked away by the body of another golem. Lyra glanced, saw Sakura, holding one leg of the golem as he had attacked, apparently defeated in her teeth. Using his body as a club, she brought it down on the torque golem, pinning it again, then leaped and stopped on it until it stopped moving. Lyra and Sakura were both panning. Look, each looking at each other, they back to the dungeon's exit, now set on guard. <sighs> Let's go! Before... before more of these things show up! Lyra panted, starting to trot. Sakura said nothing as she joined the unicorn. There were several things that Raindrops had never thought she would see in her lifetime. Or, for that matter, he was out of the possibility of seeing. Somewhere towards the top of that list was the sign of Corona. The tyrant's son, the undimmed Daystar. Hungry down and hiding behind breasts and foliage. Free Drops was hiding behind the same foliage, of course, along with all of her friends. Ducked down just beyond Tamerlan's wall. It didn't make any sense, it seemed any less weird. Stealth just didn't seem like it would have been Corona's forte. He sisters him and made it to the walls of Tamerlan about an hour before sundown, found it to be literally crawling with Grogar's golems, and that there were golems piecing along the wall's top moving back and forth before the main gate, and a few more crawling along the wall's surface itself, using the thick fluids that had grown along the side to move like spires across the web. Raindrops had managed to count at least 30 before she gave up out of frustration, and due to the waning light, decided to just take her on as advice, only to soon Grogar had more. They decided not to approach from the main gate, but instead hidden amongst the brush near the south of the wall of the city, was at a small clearing in front of it, about a hundred feet from the forest edge to the wall. Raindrops looked at Corona again, noted that the five regular polys had instinctively made sure to stand apart from her, several spaces away. Corona didn't seem to notice, however. Her eyes were narrow as so she looked over the walls, eyes darting from one area to the next. Raindrops noticed that after a few moments, the Corona seemed to be the only one focused on the walls. The rest were all keeping an eye on her. She grit her teeth a little. She knew why they all were, but... 
Okay, Raindrop said after a moment in a little voice. What's the plan? Do we have one? Deborah and our friends back around to focusing on their current needs. Not to worry that Corona might turn on them at any moment like a rabid beast. Nevertheless, it was Corona that spoke first. The walls will be our greatest challenge. See so not looking to them. They appear undamaged by the battle two millennia ago. Too many golems just to sneak by, Tracy added. So he paid particular attention to the ones crawling along the wall, pointing, We don't know how we sneak by them, anyway. We require distraction, Corona said, chilly eye here. What? Are you one of us getting them to chase after her? She asked, That'd be suicide. Corona snored, rolling her eyes. Therefore, pointless, since it require you to use the elements against Grogon. No, my little pony. I was not contenting some scheme to separate you all and eliminate you. Good. Tearly said, looking back at the wall. Maybe throw the rock trick, but how fast can we climb? Throwing a rock is unlikely to work. Crawling nodded. A much larger distraction would be necessary. An explosion of some kind. I could create such some distance away. Hot to me as we still have to climb down. Caratop said. I can't climb very well. Frankly, I don't know how Chen and he can, and we'd better do it fast enough without bullying being seen. No, we wouldn't, Raindrop Sarah objected, denying her head, Tracy. Tracy can turn us invisible. If three of us have wings, Tipsy nodded, looking back to the walls who fluttered her own wings, we can carry you over. There was a pause then. Shirley, Caratop, and Tracy looked between each other, and over at Corona, Corona grit her teeth. As I told my sister, she said slowly, as I made clear to you, I will not be the one to betray this alliance. It gains me nothing while Grogar is yet free. Ponies nevertheless looked between each other again. The three non pegasi trying to decide between them who would have the honor of being carried through the air by their tyrant son without actually having to spend time to bait. Even as the five ponies took off their south eggs, it would be unnecessary to wait. Only carried with them were the elements of harmony in Lyra's lair. At length, Caratop lay out of sight, stepped closer to Corona. Okay, let's make this quick, she said. Tracy nodded, stepping closer to Dizzy as Cheerilee moved up to Raindrops. Cheerilee was the heavier of the two, so it made more sense for Raindrops to carry her. The Trixie's horn glowed blue. She went down sight, and the each of her friends followed, Raindrops last, before Trixie could pass the name of the spell on Corona. However, the Alcorn held up a hoof. I am no stranger to a losing craft, she said, horn glowing gold as she turned herself invisible. Raindrops reached out blindly, quickly finding Charlie and hooking her legs around her barrel to beat her wings, taking to the air. Trixie, you can see us, right? Yeah, Trixie's voice provided as they gained altitude, gaining view into the city. After a moment, Trixie spoke up again. See that building with the big rock through its roof? Yellow walls, red tiles, fly towards that. Look at there, and they'll plan our next move. Raindrops obliged, diving trying not to think about how she was essentially diving towards a lot of creepy-looking, deadly, giant Sith dolls. She focused instead on Lyra, and how her life was on the line as she flew closer and closer to the wall. Even with her being a slow flyer, she managed to reach the wall in just a few seconds, passed within a few feet of one of the goblins patrolling overhead. They didn't react to her, though she held her breath as he glided past just in case. He reached the building that Trixie had indicated quickly. He passed again inside without too much noise, nor bumping into each other despite their invisibility. Once we were all in, Trixie canceled her invisibility spell, and see if Corona risked a little life in her horns to get a look at the darkened building. They were in a home. Or what was left after a giant boulder crashed through its roof. The top floor appeared to have been a single room. One bed was pressed against the wall while another hung partially over the edge of the hole that the boulder had caved. Sheets had fallen off. There were scattered clothes, papers, and most disturbingly, simple false toys scattered about. The side of the last set Pony's fur on edge, as he glanced around. Just in particular, wincing, as he was expecting to see the corpses of innocent donkeys somewhere nearby, Corona nodded. Luna and I removed every victim's body from the city. Before banishing it, bury them at sea, she said in a low voice. We had little desire to give a necromancer corpses to work with during his exile. Be at ease.
Green Fence was a certainty he could be at ease with Corona so close by, but the knowledge that he wouldn't stumble over any of Grogar's victims was at least a little comforting. She moved over to a window in the home, glancing out. Below, the cobblestone street had golems moving through it in groups of three. They were much sparser down on the wall, at least. So, what's next? Raindrops asked, looking at Corona. You said something about knowing your way to the city? Corona nodded as he walked through to another window, looking now at getting her bearings. We are not far from the palace's main gate, she noted, but they will be guarded. We should at least send head north to a guard barracks. There was a secret passage in them that led under the palace's moat into the guard barracks within the castle's walls. Does Krogar know about it? I do not know. However, it would be unwise to attempt to approach the palace itself in any way. She glanced out another window at the wall. We may have it visibly stuck into the city, but Krogar must have surrounded the palace as some sort of magical defense or sensor that would notice our passing. I would. We can't turn invisible this time, Terry noted. We have no way to see where you are going. Corona thought for a moment, then glanced at Trixie. A glamour field wrapped around us. A hemisphere. Trixie blunts. Big enough to include all six of us? She asks. Constantly changing what it's showing. I could make it, make it last five minutes. I doubt that's long enough. Corona considered. With my powers so weak. I doubt I could achieve any more. Perhaps instead, the horn glowed gold, and Raindrops felt her, fur, her skin crawl and fur stand on end. Lying back in yelp of surprise, she looked at herself, found that her fur, hair, and the elements she wore changed color, becoming jet black. The same change that had to, to each of her friends, even Corona. Only their eyes were unaffected. Corona had a small smile on her face. More to just the fools of stealth then. Warn us next time! Raindrops demanded, pointing a halt for Corona. The unicorn glanced there, but then acknowledged her request and turned to make her way over to the hole in the floor, leaping down to the building's ground level. Sighing almost as one, the ponies followed. Save Trixie, who stopped Raindrops with an outstretched hoof, glancing down the hole. She stopped a few paces back, horn glowed blue, creating illusory words in the air. Once we have Lyra back, so we use the elements of Corona right away. Raindrops blinked a few times as he read over what Trixie had written. Corona kept saying as long as Grogar was around, she wasn't going to betray them. For some reason, Raindrops actually believed her. Plus, he also had a sense that as soon as the ram was taken care of, Corona wouldn't think twice about trying to remove them as a potential obstacle towards her goal of taking Equestia back over. On the other hoof, Raindrops thought about what Corona had said about the day of her banishment. Corona lived in a delusional world where everybody was either a dupe or a traitor. She seemed to have sorted the element barriers into the former category at the moment, convinced that one had lied to them to get out to act against her. Betraying her wasn't going to help with that delusion, probably sent her deeper into it. Besides, using the elements took a lot to get out of them. Last thing they needed was to turn on Corona, and Debbie out of commission when Grogar, Bray, or a bunch of golems showed up. Found herself shaking her head. Go back first, see now. Tracy didn't seem startled by her decision. Must have Raindrops a surprise. Didn't try to argue with either. Instead, she just died grimly and followed Raindrops' lead down the hole and after Corona. Had she been in any other situation, Tierling might have actually found it enjoyably nostalgic to be creeping through a city at night to learn to avoid being seen. However, the lack of equine beings in the city, the fact that one of her friend's life was online, now she would die and discover it somehow, made the endeavor seem less than pleasant. She ended up taking the lead, knowing that she did know how to move quietly over cobblestone and through an urban environment. This is importantly how to help ponies, and it turned out one alicorn, who didn't know nevertheless to do a passable job at it. It helped that Gala patrols, always a group of three, moving with one at point, and two trailing in a loping, gorilla-like fashion, Seemed relatively sparse. Evidently, whoever had organized the city's defense did not anticipate any pony making it past the walls. Terry had a sneaky suspicion that had been Bray's fault, not Grogar's. When they had fit, it at least made her job easier, as she followed Corona's directions leading into the guard barracks. Naturally, that was where they finally encountered a serious problem. 
The barracks, a tall, rectangular stone building with crayons on its roof. Half a dozen goblins posted outside of it, standing slightly hunched and completely still apart from their heads to twist to look around like birds. The six crouched down in the shadows of an alley. This isn't good, Jaylee said. They're goblins. They're not going to get tired. Change this. She took in a deep breath and let out slowly before looking to Corona. Yet yeah, there, I think. Corona considered the goblins a moment, then smirked. Hold here! She said, sneaking back to the alley and out of sight out of the corner. The five ponies glanced at each other before Ted said, What was he doing? They had their answer five minutes later, when a building half a block away exploded. The ponies all yelped in fright, ducked low to the ground, though the sound of their cries was swallowed up by the sound of the explosion. Fiery sight in the sky, debris was scattered everywhere. The six skulls all dropped low as well at the sound, each instantly focusing in the direction of the explosion. After a moment, three detached from the group and left out towards the Chicago for Grayson, while three remained behind. They were too focused on the burning building, however, and did not notice the golden glow behind them, as Corona teleported to right behind them, until it was too late. Even as the gulls began to turn, Corona last out with three beads of fire that buried themselves in the gulls' heads, then ignited, consuming them. The gulls' headless forms dropped limply to the ground, beginning to burn. Corona looked to where the ponies were hiding, and her mane and tail once again momentarily ignited as she cast her spells. But the fires had already stuffed out, and her wings and neck both sagged slightly as she breathed. She nevertheless had the air to shoot them a look. What are you waiting for? The ponies steeled themselves, galloping over. Charlie noted that the illusions hiding their bodies had dropped. Corona, to probably lacking the air to maintain them after the fireball, teleporting a slay to Galbs. Terry tried to avoid the ladder as she opened the door to the barracks, ushering her friends inside. That explosion was still pretty near here, she warned Corona. The gulls might put two to two together come looking here. Corona smirked again, despite the tariness. Her head twitching to the right, a slate pulse going up her horn. Or somewhere else in the city, further away from the initial explosion, a second boom went off, this one larger and louder. She and Terry both glanced in this direction. I anticipate the possibility. Cross the head inside the barracks. That should throw them off. Charlie rolled her eyes, falling. That was basically throw the rock trick, you know, she pointed out. It was better, Corona contended, looking around her as her and Trixie's horrors glowed for light. The barracks was, if anything, in worse condition than the home they had taken shelter in. Though the building itself had been damaged by the flight of two millennia past, nevertheless it had been ransacked at some point. My furniture and sundry scattered across the floor. Banners having been torn from walls and empty scabbards strung everywhere, spears with their tips missing. Terry thought of the teeth of the golems and how they were made of jagged pieces of broken metal, and claws capped with blades, and nodded to herself. This is where Grogar got the sharp parts of his golems, she reasoned. They glanced at Corona. You didn't leave him with any corpses, but you did leave him with an entire city to build an army with anyway. Corona scouts and moved away from Cheerilee. Towards the door that, once open, revealed a staircase that went down to street level, to a basement. I did not anticipate my sister's betrayal. She had told us she started down it, and police falling, away from the streets of Tamar. Corona was letting her voice rise to the normal speaking levels as she descended. And I wanted to kill him outright! It was Luna who decided and demanded he be made to suffer. There was silence at that. The corona glanced back. Ice narrow as he reached the bottom of the stairs. No retort, she asked. No objections. No claiming Luna's innocence. This he met corona's gaze. Luna was honest with us, she said. She told us it was her idea. She also told us that tiny chains and sea changes with them. That's why we were here. To pass the city, but take Grogar back to the question so he can be sentenced to a real jail. So you wouldn't have to suffer anymore. Corona led them through the basement, which was loaded with ransacked supplies. First open wide cast of piles of rotting flour that had presumably been kept for a sacks. Then the sacks had gone towards the construction of the galls that patrolled the streets above. Corona glanced at Ditsy. Imprisonment? She asked and scoffed. No, my sister would not simply grow guys some dozen where he would rot. 
See now it values knowledge too highly. She would have words with him, convinced it to aid her, solidify her hold on Equestria. Shelley rolled her eyes at that, but then it rise to Corona's face as he reached the hall, which Corona stopped in front of. Whatever, she said. The state of it sets me already. Corona opened her mouth to say something back as she ran a hoof along the wall, probably looking for his switch. Whatever she wanted to say was probably scathing, but she paused in confusion. Looking at his chair lace, he found the hidden switch and flipped it open. Open sesame. She echoes the wall's nearly groan, but then a sex of it began to move aside, revealing a long, narrow, and above all else, dark passage. Charlie chuckled and said the other pony as he proceeded to the passage. Corona, for once, brought up the rear, brow furrowed the confusion. I don't understand, she says, the wall closed behind him. Charlie and Corona's horns flared up bright to provide more illumination. What do seeds have to do with anything? Charlie chuckled again at that, as the six proceeded through the passage towards the palace of Tamberlon. Must have must have a joke, but I made them laugh. That's what they needed right now. The bargain liar wanted to describe the palace of Tamerlan as being as solid in the grave. In spite of every other part of Lyra, really not wanting to use that phrasing. Nevertheless, seeds of Cora heard new sounds as they walked through the castle's halls. Even their own hoofsteps were mumbled, as the floors of the palace were covered in thick rugs. Why aren't we seeing any guards? Lyra was fiercely tried, sinking close to the walls of the shadows. I do not know why this could be so. Sakura so says he glanced out the window, but he could see the city burning in two places over the twilight. Perhaps my queen's attack plays so role in the gods' lack. Might be my friends, Lyra persisted, though eternally she had to admit that that fire was something that most of her friends avoided. Lyra was to serve what she would do with the two men to escape, then ran into Corona. Run? Certainly. Die? Probably. So he crossed that bridge which he had to. However, as he instead chose to focus on the palace itself, the ceilings were high and vaulted, its walls made of stone perfectly carved bricks. I like to see, yes, I. The palace seemed to be well maintained to the point where Lyra wondered if Groger hadn't, knowing his exile ending soon, cleaned out the place for some reason. Oh my god, we're in Barovia! I just realized we're in Barovia! It's all dead! We're dead! We're dead! We're... It's all over! Do you have any idea where we're going? Lyra asked. Sakura so only shook her head. That was fair, I was supposed. It wasn't like she had any more of an idea if she was leading. Sakura so managed to navigate them for a dozen cells out to the palace proper. Though so now, every hallway looked nearly identical. At length, two equines came to a set of double doors. The window behind them confirmed that they did go out into the city, but it was more than they had previously encountered. I would risk a little horn light to lift the door over. That would be intricately carved wood. Depicting a pastoral scene of donkeys farming, gathering at harvest, and carrying them out towards the sun illuminated city. Tamerlan itself, most likely. She so reached up to the hoof to open the door, but Sorcora stopped her, not towards the walls of the door she was set into. On either side were a smaller set of doors. Several entrances, I should think, she said, though these we should sneak. Lyra nodded. Follow Sakura over to one, carefully opening it. The door's hinges might as well be well oiled, as it barely made a sound as the two proceeded into a narrow hallway with stairs leading up and around a corner. From that corner, there was a frickly glow, like a torchlight. Lyra and Sakura glanced at each other for a moment before heading up the stairs toward it. The stairwell led them to a long, narrow balcony, looking up at a wide open room, probably the former throne room or a ballroom. Lyra picked up a gas at the sight of it. It was huge, undoubtedly the largest room on the ground floor, at least a hundred feet wide, three times that long. Pillars around its edges supported a vaulted floor roof that was obscured by shelves and smoke from the torches that set at regular intervals to the room's ground floor. The room was utterly so eyes empty, save for three things. The first was a magic circle that had been drawn with white chalk onto the floor. The circle contained an inverted paragraph and, between the points of the pentagram, five equine skulls, all gazing inwards. The circle was easily thirty or forty feet across, yet it was perfect, as were the lines of the pentagram. The second thing, immediately before the circle, was a large bronze bell. 
ten feet tall, and probably weighing at least half a ton, if not more. The bell was held up by an intricately carved wooden structure, and laying beneath it was a thick wooden mallet, probably meant to ring the bell. It was also somehow glowing with its own dim, off-green light. The third thing, yelling before the bell with closed eyes, horns glowing white with power, was Grogar. Fire and Sakura both stifled gas to the side of the ram, even dozens of feet away below them. The ram didn't seem to notice them, however. His mouth was moving, but they were too far away to hear whatever he was saying. Somehow, Lyra figured that was probably for the best. After a moment, Grogar's mazic flared slightly as he stood, and mallet before the bell lifted and struck it. A long, low note reverberated from the bell, filling the hall, feeling like it was vibrating Lyra's very being. Grogar looked at the magic circle when the bell ring disappeared, said that name that Lyra didn't want to hear again, not once, not twice, but three times. Tirek, Tirek, Tirek. Then Grogar was down again, on his knees in hawks, once again speaking a too low a voice to be heard. Lyra grabbed his Akora, who looked as frightened as Lyra felt, caught her head towards the way he had entered. The zebra needed no encouragement as she and Lyra began moving backwards. Grogar remained focused on whatever he was doing. He didn't notice anything, but he could their escape back the way he had come, to the great double doors that were the main entrance to the profane hall that he had just left. I see. We find another way, Sakura whispered. No argument, Lyra agreed. 